Shut up and sit down. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Fight for Liberty show. Today, we have a uh, very awesome guest, uh, Stacey Brassman. She is not only a comedian, a businesswoman, a public speaker, but she is now a candidate for New York City mayor. Uh, and I'm very excited to be supporting her in that campaign. Uh, so, Stacey, thank you so much uh, for coming on and for thank talking you. to us today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here in my home studio. <laughs> Normally, I would be going to different radio stations or going to your home studio. But since COVID, we are not doing that. We're doing just uh, home studio work and then trying to figure out my whole lighting, even though I should have been doing this from the beginning. But I always was one to like to be in the studio because it was that excitement when you walk. I used to love to go to Sirius XM. I'd go in and be all these people running around in every different field. They have like actors and and rock stars and politicians and it just it was so much fun. So, but it's great to be here <laughs> on yeah, StreamYard. I, I definitely uh, I definitely miss the, the the studio kind of feel um, and uh, the like officialness of of doing business that way and like actually having people come to the studio. Uh, but I have enjoyed because it become so much more normal you like virtual interviews like this it's definitely widened the variety of people that go on other people's shows so that's, no, been yeah, fun. that's, that's, that's a good point all all kinds of people celebrities and people high in, up in, in different fields like my friend had run dmc on his show and all these people they probably won't oh, nice. the studio yeah cup, yeah it was fun i did a lot of cool shows with really interesting people so that was great Oh, and hopefully we can kind of combine the old way and the new way eventually and have have studios back up and running, but also this kind of culture mm -hmm. of talk to people all over the place. Right. Exactly. Because <laughs> we have a, do have a door. It's like a dorm room in here. So, practically. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to start off most uh, of the first appearances on the show with just kind of a, a like thousand foot overview of kind of your political testimony what's happened in your life that kind of has caused you to believe uh, and feel the the things that you believe and feel sure is that a question or you want to start it that yeah. way yeah go ahead. <laughs> um so i've been doing uh media type work for years so which is nothing to do with policy politi pol pol politics but i started off um as an actor in my in college, you know, before that, but like in college, like specifically acting and all that kind of stuff. And then I didn't stop doing that, but I still did a lot of acting up until I started doing stand up, where that became my primary focus. And then when I did stand up, I started doing motivational speaking. So I just put that on the side for a second. At the same time, throughout my entire life, I was always an activist for animal rights, for uh, local politicians. If I liked what they had to say, I worked a lot with the when i was younger i worked with the league of women voters and um in 2012 i helped headcount with their online registering to vote campaign which was using they usually use musicians but i helped bring the comedians in with a group of other people so it was really fun and we registered over 40 to 50 i think one of the highest at that time social media registrations ever online you know so, yeah, so that was really fun. And I've just always been active in my own way in the political system. Mm -hmm. So the question, why is this woman who has been in show business and, you know, a comedian uh, want to run for mayor of New York City? Well, here's the answer. I born and bred New York, New Yorker. I'm also been like very apt in like trying to develop policy for things. So 
in the years prior, I was always like, well, if they did this, we should change this, the budget should go here. Why didn't this happen? So I decided during this whole pandemic, it's like, and watching the dysfunction of my mayor, you know, near, uh, de Blasio, and, and that wasn't a reactionary. My, my, my run isn't reactionary. It's just, it's proactive. So I wanted to proactively take, you know, take a stand. And I talked to Larry Sharp one day, and this is actually before, actually, this is before the pandemic. I bumped into him in a studio. We were doing uh, radio at the same place. And I bummed into Larry and I'm like, I want to run for mayor. And then when I, when I kind of settled in and I got a chance to really talk to him, this is how it happened. And now I have a team, I have a website, I have a campaign donation button open. And uh, that's really how it started. And we, and all the policies um, I'm writing with uh, a, a bunch of other libertarians. There's a Republican, there's a Democrat, there's, it's a very, you know, it's it's really exciting because it's a real think tank when we write policy. It's not just one sided, and you know, it's very like I want to hear all the sides because, as Larry said, you can be very liberal, you can be very conservative, but you can still be a libertarian, which I love so much because that's the real. I mean, if you really want to take the political process, that is the political process. Is you know, I don't. That's why I don't understand why in 2020 we don't have very strong uh, numbers for the third parties. Everyone's either voting against somebody not, rather than for somebody, and that's what I've noticed quite often, is that people are actually voting against somebody, or that guy's better than this guy, but I don't really like either of them. Right. That's what I've heard in a lot of elections. Yeah, it's either... The last, yeah, the last election people actually voted for was the first Obama. I, I think what I remember, people were really excited about that. They were energized. What is this you know, man going to do? And you know, 2012 election was very energized, but I, but I, from what I remember. Yeah, Obama's Obama's first election was was closer to to what we're talking about with like actually wanting to vote for somebody. I think that was the, I agree. I think that was the last time I I saw that, and that was the first election I actually paid attention to because I would have been right. I was 12 when Obama got elected, so you know that was the first real election that I actually, you know, cared about, watched the debates for and stuff like that. And then by the time uh, 20, uh, his re-election came around in 2012, I was like, had already been disillusioned with the political process. I didn't like him or Mitt Romney. <laughs> when you were 18, before you even voted, you were already delusioned. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like a 16 year old that had already given up on politics. And really? then uh, basically, uh, and then in 2016, my dad showed me Gary Johnson. And that oh, wow. was okay. that was what kind of got me back into the maybe there's a hope for this thing. Maybe people can run for office and and be anti-government at the same time. And right. that was something that I hadn't seen yet at that time. You know, that there was somebody out there that agreed with gun rights and decriminalization of marijuana, because at the I, time I had yet to meet anyone that had both of those stances. I think people are so polarized, so you can't have somebody who I'm a person that believes that you can do whatever the hell you want to do. Just don't hurt anybody else or any being. Right. That's my philosophy in life. That's why I live by that philosophy. Um, I may not, you know, gel with everybody and they're what they want to do with their lives or how they do it. And that's, you know, just like you won't gel with my life because people have told me a million times, why do you do this? Why? So I'm like, and I realized <laughs> You know, after years, it's like it's no one's fucking business. I'm like, I'm gonna say fuck, right? This is oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. for sure. Not, I, I said fuck on a, <laughs> a real radio show the other day because I'm so used to saying whatever the fuck I want. So, um, <laughs> you know, I say fuck. I'm not a perfect. You know, I'm not a perfect human being, and I, you know, I don't claim to ever be one, and mm -hmm. I don't expect anybody else to be a perfect human being. But one of my philosophies in life, and it helped me, because I've always been like kind of a free spirit in a lot of ways. I always. Uh, sort of beat by my own drum kind of thing, whatever mm -hmm. you call it. Um, I feel that people, if they take responsibility for whatever actions they do, whatever it is, mm -hmm. good, bad, and different, if you take responsibility and every action that you do, you say to yourself, is this, is this going to hurt somebody else? Or I'm taking responsibility for myself. And 
that's all I could do, that is a step in the right direction. Because once we all take self-responsibility, then we have a bunch of a, a society of people that are taking self-responsibility and they're not being told, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I think right. that is a really great way to govern. And I think it's a great way to create a society of people that are responsible for their own being and their own place, and their own community. Otherwise, you just have people, you know, this like martial, not, I mean, martial is being exaggerated, but you have these just people like being parented by the government, which is terrible. Mm. And that, yeah, I, don't need I think we to- see that more in New York than anywhere else, too. Um, you know, a lot of people, as I ran for uh, New York City Council uh, in 2019, uh, to I ran in the special election to replace Jumani Williams after he won the public oh, advocate wow. seat. Um, and so many of the people that I talked to were, were yeah, completely okay with that parenting kind of, you know, we like to use the term nanny state. Like people are okay with that. People like nannies, people like babysitters and like people that are able to to make decisions for them so that they don't have to make those decisions anymore Um, we're in a unique city and i i I, you know i think now i think i think now we're not i think people have definitely said enough is enough i i see that with everybody i know on every side of the party people are just like and every side of you know the dems the pub they're like enough we need Mm -hmm. this we want this open our businesses up we're going to do it safely, whatever we need to do, just like, let's get back to some, you know, life and, and so, do something because I feel like mm-hmm. people do not want to be told what to do anymore. Like, I think they're done. They're like, okay, we've had this this way. And now we need to sort of go back to, I think this was like the great equalizer. This pandemic was like, it made people wake, wake up, you know, realize that they can't be, you know, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, people were just running on empty. Let's talk about New York City for a second, because specifically New York City, and I'm sure the rest of the country, but I know living here and working here and hustling my butt off for years, um, literally (laughs) in uh, the entertainment field and doing, I did sales. I did, I, you know, I ran companies. So basically um, I've been in a lot of different businesses in my life and I've been hustling my entire life and it was, it's exhausting. And the city, it's just, it's crowded, right? We have subways. You can't even get on the subway sometimes because it's too many people. I mean, not anymore right now, but <laughs> there was too many people where you were like, that wasn't good either. There was, right. That was not that was not a healthy environment to thrive either. People were just like, they, of course they're sheep. They're just like, they have, not, they have no energy to do political, you know, have endeavors or take action and like protest. They're like, oh, they're barely able to get to work in the morning because they can't get on the subway. They have to wait for the next, and then they're late for work. And then they have a boss that's yelling at them. You know, why are you like, Ugh? You know, then you're waiting in line for Starbucks and the line for Starbucks is like a million, you know, two hours long. And then by the time you get your latte, you're like mm-hmm. you're 20 minutes late for work. Your boss is yelling at you. You have clients in, in the office waiting. It's like it's like that's how we live here. Now, my right. friends in other places, they drive to work. They go through the drive through. They get their coffee. The boss, no one, everyone's calm. Mm-hmm. You know, we live in a very tense city. So, you know, it's fine, but you need to be ready for that. You need to be prepared for that. And I think when everything stopped, it kind of made people get, you know, it's like when you stop running, you like, oh, I'm fe- having feelings. I'm having like uh, sort of like points of view. I'm having like a, mm-hmm. an epiphany because I'm able to sit with myself. It's like meditation. You sit with yourself and things. But almost people almost were forced to be in some sort of self-meditation. A lot of people had to stop and yeah. look at their lives. A lot of people, their relationships, their their, their job, their careers. A lot of people changed careers over this um, pandemic. Mm-hmm. They're like, I don't like to be doing what I'm doing. I don't want to be selling, you know, computer software. I want to, you know, write a book or I want to, you know, hey. I want to like travel the world and, you know, whatever people, you know, they, I want to start my own business. I've been doing, wanting to do this for years. And I've heard that from so many different people. Mm-hmm. My, my, my very dear friend, who's a co-host of the Pressman Hour, uh, Angela, shout out to Angela. She lost a hundred pounds and now she's a fitness like guru. Like she was like a hundred pounds overweight. Damn girl. Yeah, she lost a hundred pounds and now she's um like all muscle and like doing fitness competitions. Like she changed her life. That's like awesome. this pandemic changed her life. For whatever reason, it changes people. So when you sit with yourself, as bad as you know it is for our economy and lockdowns and shutdowns and whatnot has been really awful. I think mm-hmm. it made people really sit with themselves. Yeah. I 
I kind of have been struggling with myself because, you know, everybody complains, you know, 2020 is the worst year ever, you know, zero out of 10 would not recommend, right? Uh, there's all of these jokes and 2020 has been the best year of my life by far. Really? Um, it started Why? out. Um, well, I, I rang in the new year um, with Tulsi Gabbard working for her campaign. Oh, I love her. I love um, Tulsi. Oh my God, yeah. I love Tulsi. You know, I love Tulsi, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's an amazing human. I, 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 I love her personally. Like, even if she never does anything politically ever again, I would still take a bullet for her. She's one of the most amazing humans I've ever met. Uh, but so, yeah, I, I rang in because uh, my birthday uh, is the 29th. So I spent my birthday, birthday in New Year's. Oh my God, Thank yeah. you. Um, so I spent my birthday in New Year's out, up there and kind of started both 2020 and being 23 right about the same time in that mode, working 80, 90 hour week weeks for her as a volunteer that was just getting like my housing and food covered, not caring about that because you know, I'm 23, you know, the, the long term career mindset isn't super necessary right now. Uh, so I was able to kind of take this year. <laughs> I was able to kind of take this year and do those things. And uh, then the pandemic hit and I spent uh, Tulsi dropped out and I came back to my parents' house and, you know, like you said, people did things that they had been putting off for a long time. This this YouTube channel even, I started when I was running for office and then basically ignored for the entire seven months that I worked for Tulsi <laughs> um, and oh, then wow. got back home and I was like, I have nothing better to do. Let's record me talking to people. And it I started having guests on. I ended up uh, getting to interview, you know, some actually really awesome people in the LP um, before I kind of took another big break from it to go back into campaigning. Um, but it's been I've met more people this year and experienced more things, been to more places, seen more beautiful views this year than the rest of my life. So that's amazing. I'm, See, I'm a fan. Of said all that, I, I actually thought, I, I actually you know, I, I didn't, I found it the same way. I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I miss doing like, I, I was touring a lot, like before this whole nonsense, I was touring mm -hmm. so much. And um, I was like always running from like city to, you know, to the, to back to Brooklyn on the train and then to like a podcast and then run, I mean, running to like Pennsylvania. And I loved a lot of the shows I've done and they were incredible, but it was nice not to have to run so much you know and and just be like in my own yeah. space and that was really healthy and i'm here taking care of my mom who's in her 80s and that's been nice even though we fight a lot and when i got a little when i got a little too much i airbnb for like three months somewhere downtown so that was nice too so i mean i've definitely been able to get my stuff together as well so i feel like mm -hmm. it hasn't been all bad I, I i i had a lot of personal growth it sounds very hippy dippy but i had a lot of personal growth and that's really, I think that it's not, for, you know, you know, and there's a lot of loss here. You know, there's a lot of loss, mm -hmm. a lot of loss of, of life. A lot of people, you know, passed away that I knew from COVID, from other diseases. And it's mm -hmm. been, that's been hard. So, yeah. you know, it's been a year of like some, some sort of trans, transformation. And I definitely don't think it's been terrible. But it's been terrible for some people. They've lost their businesses and mm -hmm. they've lost uh, their spirit. So that, you know, so that's. The idea is like I hope that we can bring that up again in, in yeah. somehow. Yeah, I'm I got I'm very thankful. Um I only knew personally two people that passed away because of COVID. Um one of them was a friend from the city and uh my sister's father in law oh, wow. um passed away. <laughs> uh that one was was actually really crazy because he just he went to into the hospital um in Ecuador where they live. Um for a knee surgery and caught COVID in the hospital during heard the surgery people, that happened a lot and then ended up passing away. So like, uh, but That's he had, terrible. he had crazy amounts of like underlying health conditions. Like when, when he caught it and he tested positive, it was, it was almost one of those like, okay, that you're, you're probably going to die from this because you know, really? heart, heart problems, health problems. Like he was, they moved to Ecuador because um, the, uh, the altitude and the humidity there didn't bother 
um, both of their health problems as much oh, wow. um, and healthcare is significantly cheaper there. Uh, so that was like part, part of the reason they moved there was for their health issues. Uh, so it, it wasn't necessarily a surprising one. Like once we knew that he was positive, it was already a kind of a somber moment. Uh, but I count myself fairly lucky that, you know, it was, you know, I wasn't that close to him. You know, it's my sister's father-in-law. So I did, I've met him half a dozen times. Uh, and yeah, not, not, not a huge list, which I'm sure it would have been bigger if I had stayed in the city for a little bit longer, but I got out of the city to work for Tulsi That's and I good. only went back for two weeks to petition for her in January. And I haven't, been, I haven't stepped where, with this. Where were you? Um, were you just traveling with her? Uh, I was in New Hampshire for four months um, and then spent about a month and a half in Utah running like Utah, Colorado, Wyoming area uh, volunteers for her. That's beautiful out there too. So. Oh my gosh. I loved it so much. And then I, I just spent the last two months in Colorado, like the Western slopes. Uh, I love the mountains and that area. I will probably put down roots out there if I don't. It's beautiful. My cousin lives out there. The He's city. young. You're from the city as well. Are you from the city as well? Well, I uh, so I grew up upstate um, and then moved to the city at 19. And How far upstate? There from, where, where upstate? Uh, Syracuse. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I, so, I, I used to travel a lot. I did a lot of comedy. Mm -hmm. Syracuse, Binghamton, Rochester, Messina. I've been. I literally have been every. Where? Like places that people are like, are you there? I'm like, they'll mention a town you don't know. I'm like, I bet you I'd know the town. And uh, like 90% of the time, I'm like, I did comedy there. Like, really? Yeah. Like, That's Canadian cities. It's, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Syracuse has some pretty good comedy. Uh, oh, they club. do. They're very, they're very, a, there's a lot fan. of big comics that come out of Syracuse. Yeah. We used to perform a lot. I used to perform a lot. There's nothing there. better to do up here than just like make fun of how shitty it is up here. <laughs> it's like, yeah. you're just cold and miserable and there's nothing really to do so it's just like yeah let's just tell jokes about how cold and miserable it is i know it's fun i love syracuse and they're really cool people up there i i i find like i like towns i, I like going to small towns i don't like look down like people like in the city would always say oh you go you know you're no i love small. i can spend days in a small town and just love it you know mm -hmm. i don't and i don't I'm like oh i and i and i come back and i'm like okay <laughs> like i used yeah. to be like you're not gonna like you're gonna be bored I'm like no there's always like a great cafe there's always good food i always find except like one place i think i went to right i think i went to kentucky and i was just i couldn't find good coffee and <laughs> <That, laughs> i don't know why I, no i've definitely been to places this year that were less than ideal um i know where i was in colorado for the last couple of weeks i was doing most of my grocery shopping at a dollar general because that was like it was about a 20 minute half an hour drive to walmart and a safe way if i if i really wanted to do like real grocery shopping but that's they only have in dollar do they have i mean here they don't have they, we have dollar we have dollar tree they have like a little bit of food mm -hmm. they don't really have yeah, yeah like dollar can. dollar general is a little bit better than dollar tree when it comes to food because um, it's not an everything is dollar store so they're able to you know uh have right. actual food uh but it's still not great you know there's nothing healthy there's zero produce or like meat right. or anything like that so trying to uh keep up the diet that i had started about halfway through this year uh was very difficult through of that course. and now i'm home and my mom keeps making christmas cookies mm -hmm. and my grandma just brought me fudge yesterday and i'm like Ooh, i'm trying to diet people like <laughs> send some fudge <laughs> over I I, I, yeah i mean it was um yeah i missed the, I, I i go to the gym <laughs> um here it just reopened it opens it closes it's like all right enough it's like i can't you know then they wear the mask they don't you know some guys running on the treadmill has mask on sweat it. you know it's like it's like i don't want to die in the gym it's like <laughs> <laughs> i get nervous i don't you don't know what people you know there are a lot of people walking around asymptomatic and that makes my friend just thinks she, my friend's friend she was out to dinner with them and uh he he tested positive for covid and then she's not feeling well now, my best friend. So we're oh. really worried now. So it's scary. It's a little, it's still scary. It's looming. Every time you, you think everything's normal, then it's like this looming feeling like, mm -hmm. you know, so 
and you hear horror stories and then i have friends that you know have a million underlining underlining conditions and they had they have they're like fine now they had covid and they're like mm-hmm. there was nothing so it's like it's yeah. different that's a unpredictable disease that no one knows really that's the scary part about it it's like when you have a cold you kind of know you have a cold right yeah the flu not great but you know you're gonna get sick then you're gonna it's gonna go away maybe you'll not feel so good but this mm-hmm. is like people don't know what's going to happen to them. I think that's part of the, um, the anything that's non-predictable is very frightening to people. Yeah, and it creates it creates chaos. Yeah, and and the the people in charge uh, know that, and you know to their credit, uh, you know it, it didn't work out great, but I think it was done with the best intentions. You know, like people have been sitting shitting on the cdc the whole time but like they tried to speculate to try to give people an idea that they were helping you know the social distancing and the masks and the hand sanitizer and everything it was you know even though a lot of that has been proven to be hit or miss it's you know they were trying to at least give people some sort of fake predictability to this thing like as long as you do this thing you'll be okay because otherwise i think the world would have collapsed if we didn't have like the masks and some form of like semi-normal stuff happening back in the summer and like you know starting a process of of like understanding it i people would have gone insane well no i know it's scary i mean people did when i when after like march april may like when people started going out again and the wet restaurants are opening, and the hair salons open, and you know when we were reopening slowly here in New York City specifically, um, I realized you know it was scary. We didn't know, you know, when to wear the mask, when not to wear the mask. Uh, I tend not to wear the mask when I'm not around people. I I don't I, I well I put it I'm like one of those I'm the on and off people. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm walking and there's no one around, I'm not wearing my mask. Sorry. I mean, maybe I don't. That, I, well, I mean, no one's there. I'm not spreading germs, and I'm not getting germs. Just like right. if you don't, you're not wearing. It's like not wearing. It's like wearing a condom when no one's around. It's like you're not wearing. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I always uh, equate. When people fight with me with the mask. I'm like, I equate it to condoms. It's like it helps. You know. It's like it's mm-hmm. a blockage. You know. Think of it yeah. as a blockage. It's not yeah. perfect. It's not perfect. People have gotten pregnant with condoms, but if you have two condoms, it's more. It's more, it's more. <laughs> I mean, right. I don't know how else to explain it. It's like. People are very, yeah. you know, we have a lot of anti-maskers, so I explain it like it's like... There's a lot um, of people that don't like condoms. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they risk of getting AIDS or herpes or whatever people get nowadays, gonorrhea, syphilis, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you have less of a chance to get it. So just look at it that way. I mean, when we had, you know, when I was younger, um, we had AIDS day. Like, I was a kid. I was, mm-hmm. even, I was barely sexually active at all. I wasn't even sexually active. Maybe I was kissing boys at the time, whatever, kissing everybody. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, they would have AIDS day. You know how scary mm-hmm. that is to, like, a 14-year-old girl and, and boy or in, in, in school? And they talk about oh, yeah. AIDS and they're showing bananas with condoms. And, like, you haven't even had sex with half the kids yet. Most of the kids didn't have sex at that point. So it was like – and then and then you had this looming deadly disease that they're like, if you have to wear a condom, you know, they would, it was drilled in our head. So like mm-hmm. it's still in your head, you know, like to this day, like it's not, yeah, it's not, you know, it, it, even married couples are like, where we're, you know, so it's like a scary thing back in the, mm-hmm. in the, you know, in the eighties when they had the condoms, that was really scary. Yeah. That was actually one of the, the bigger reasons uh, that I was homeschooled uh, is because my parents didn't condoms? want that. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, kind of, but just like, um, the the two biggest things because i was i was raised very uh like conservative christian but it wasn't necessarily uh the fact that they wanted to teach me like christian things but it was the it was having a science that wasn't based on evolution and it was not having that sex ed uh, oh, and, really? and it was the more most important reason was the one-on-one education my mom actually has a degree in education she is very smart in everything but english like his was the only thing that she struggled really with to teach me and my dad's really wow. really good at that kind of stuff so i was able to get a better education than the kids that went to the public school i would have gone to so that that was their main reasoning is they just wanted to give me a better quality of education but but not exposing me to that 
AIDS day? Uh, uh, like, yeah, the AIDS <laughs> day and the because by the time I went through high school or middle school, like it was it was like a month long part of the curriculum of sex ed in like eighth, seventh grade. And it's That's just true. it's sure not enough. necessary. You right. Don't understand it. You're not even in that at that age. You don't you're not even doing that yet. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I was like I mean, 16 when I kissed I the first grade, girl. Ninth, tenth grade, but not that age because you're you don't really understand. You're not even. It's not like, yeah. and then you don't, yeah, it's like a weird, I mean, education never hurts, obviously, but it, I don't think it actually scares kids. It might, they don't understand. We didn't have, junior high school, we didn't have sex ed. We didn't have sex ed until like 10th, 9th, 10th grade, 11th yeah. grade. That's, that's more sane, I think. But yeah, by the time, by the time I would have gone through uh, that kind of stuff, like it was, it was a big part of their education and i was still you know i was a boy scout and i had i had friends that went to public school i wasn't like a super sheltered homeschooler like most like a lot of my homeschooled friends were so right. i kind of got like a filtered version uh, of it and kind of like a trickle down sex ed <laughs> in in middle school and you know by the time i was in high school you know they i still took biology you know they still even in the homeschool curriculum still cover like the important parts of how babies are made and, and that, like safety in that area but it wasn't like something that was super scary you know and like if you if you don't do sex perfectly you're either gonna have a baby or get aids or something <laughs> like something's gonna you're gonna die you know there's the scene in mean girls it's like you will get gonorrhea and you will die it's like luckily that's not how sex was originally introduced to my to my brain and so i think i just have a fundamentally different view of relationships than a lot of my friends because of it well, uh, that's good. i mean that's important because otherwise i have my humidifier smoke <laughs> uh -huh. um uh yeah i mean it's true it's i think that people you know i guess it's up to the parents how they want to educate their children about sex too you know right you know but i think education is important to a degree because otherwise people are just not going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, in terms of safety and I mean, I think the people kind of eased up a lot of people, the whole condom thing. Like when I talk to my younger friends, they're like, we don't use condoms. I'm like, that's, you know, I'm like, it's interesting how, how mm -hmm. different the attitude is. Age is curable. I'm like, well, herpes isn't. So. <laughs> yeah, there is definitely, I'll, I'll, I've noticed that there is definitely a, a culture shift uh in the fact that like the the younger millennials and the older like gen z age group that i kind of fall into uh yeah there's it's definitely not it wasn't drilled in quite as heavily i i don't think because you don't have that whole most like, of us don't wear condoms. you don't have that whole right you don't have to drill it in that wasn't scared that wasn't what scared you guys right um because now it's, now it's yeah. just breathing next to somebody <laughs> <You know? laughs> now it's just yeah breathing next to somebody right <laughs> yeah i feel like uh at this point the scariest part about sex for people my age is the baby oh the baby like, oh. like we're way more scared about that than than the diseases because most of the diseases like you said are curable at this point and the ones that aren't are starting to become a little bit less uh prevalent in society so yeah we're a lot more worried about the baby which is easy to solve also if they're on birth control so it's kind of right. a it's a it's an easy cop out and you guys uh, have the hpv vaccine that we didn't have right There's a lot of stuff that you guys have that we didn't have so mm -hmm. enjoy your young people sex <laughs> <laughs> so i i'm curious uh you know we talked about why you got into uh politics but i'm curious what drove you into uh a career in comedy oh interesting well um i think part of it was my need to be able to be free in my speech and not be just told what to say through a script because you know when you're an actor you have to be playing a part which i love doing i love acting i love being other people but you know i felt there was a lot of like uh i felt like boxed in and i felt like i couldn't speak and say what i wanted and uh not that acting stopped me from that but it was like you have to be a certain way you, be, you know and in comedy it felt free i felt free and open to talk about what i wanted to talk about and to joke about things and talk about you know taboo things and talk about things that are no one's talking about and you know i was very influenced by you know a few comics that were very open and free about 
talk about their own lives without shame and that kind of thing. And that was really great to see. And I think that's one of the reasons why I got into comedy. And uh, it was it was a self like self empowerment, and also it was something that I felt I was able to do, and I was able to do it and make a living at it. So it was really it is a really great field for me when I did it. I started started later actually in life. I didn't start like right out of college. I started like ten years after college. So um, huh. I was a little older when I, well at the time I was older. For, now it'd be considered normal age, but that was older for stand ups. And there wasn't a lot of females out around then doing it, you know. Right. So it was like not a common career. Well, I didn't start that many years ago, but in the early 2000s, right after 9-11, was probably pushed me to start. Mm-hmm. I, was, I lived through 9-11 in New York City, so that pushed me. Yeah, that definitely. Uh, I luckily was still upstate when that happened, but that I have a lot of friends that that count that as like a, a trigger moment in their life. It was definitely a trigger moment. So I, I was, I just, you know, I was kind of the thing that I always wanted to do it and I just never did it. And then I did it. Then I had a fr- you know, friend say, come on and do it. And then I did it, you know, <laughs> then it was like, <laughs> one of these, and I just started doing it. And I was out on stage literally two times a night, uh, between open mice and little rooms. And then, you know, trapped, I, I toured a lot right from the beginning, like probably right in the first few six months of comedy, I was touring already, like you know, <laughs> opening up for people and things like that. So I had like an th- act almost right away. That's good. Uh, do you think it was, it was easier for you to transition into that from, from a life of acting rather than, you know, uh, if you had been in a, like a business career or something a little bit more uh, buttoned up? Well, I think I, um, I think as an actor, you already are, you're on stage and part of, I guess, comedy is having some sort of stage presence. So I was already prepared that way. And I was always in, I was in improv. I was in a show called Grandma Sylvia's Funeral in the nineties and it was a lot of improv. So I was literally within the improv. I was like already writing comedy without realizing it because you had to like do this. We did the same show eight, you know, it was eight shows a week. So you got used to doing these improvs and they almost became like written bits without realizing it because it was, <laughs> It would be, you know, you did improv, but you'd also, the answers would always be this. People usually answer the questions kind of similar. It's, you know, the public, when they you ask a question, they would always, like, answer with it. And then you'd always have an answer, you know, or I'd have to be on the spot and do it. And I do the same thing with stand. I would do a lot of improv and a lot of mm. people talking, you know, talking to the audience and getting feedback. So it's a lot of the same, it's a lot of that same stuff and obviously a lot of written material. So um, I learned how to write a joke and I learned that stuff like later on more, but you know, and uh, so that was more just practice. And now I just write on stage. I could be doing a set. I'll just write on stage something. You know, I'll just start writing on stage. <laughs> that, which is one of, <laughs> that's like the biggest thrill I get on stand up is like actually going on stage, you know, in, in a show that I'm being like paid for and, and, and then like really writing the jokes as I go, which is the most exciting thing for me right now. When I do stand up, which I haven't done in real, that's- in front of people in a while. So, that's something I do miss live audiences. They were great. Mm-hmm. Live audiences is nothing like it. I mean, one of the last shows I had, I, I would have my, my trajectory before the pandemic was I was traveling. I was in the middle of like this, like self healing stuff. So I went to Los Angeles. I had an audition and then I, I had no shows, but I took a few weeks off. It was the end of February. <clears throat> So in the beginning of February, uh, end of February, being in March, so I was right before I left, I had a really, really big show. It was like 600 people there. And it was incredible. We had a great night, made nice money. And, you know, people were laughing and it was a great night. Then I went, I hadn't been feeling well. I was having a lot of like, that's why I think I had COVID because I was having a lot of upper respiratory infections and I didn't realize what they were from. I kept going into the urgent care. Mm -hmm. They're like, not you know bacterial not the flu so i was choking and coughing and it was horrible so then um i ended up going to la to relax because i I thought maybe the sun will help and i had friends and i had an audition so i went to la and not really to work just to do one thing and then i came back and i got sick again i was strep throat and then that kind of ended and then i never went on stage again because you know everything closed and some people are doing outdoor shows and I haven't really done did you do any I don't think I've done any I did like a zoom a few zoom shows which 
one was fun. One was the one, one, the thing didn't work, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it shut me off in the middle. Why was the one ick? Uh, because it, it was like, why, there, why was the use, one ick? They use Evite instead of Zoom and it, it doesn't work as well. Like it doesn't mm. have as good of a program and it was just a disaster. Like it was like, I was repeating the voices were repeating <laughs> The Zoom is the only way to go. If you're going to do a show online, use Zoom because it doesn't work otherwise. Like if you do a stand-up show, yeah. the, the other programs aren't The, the people that created Zoom had no idea how rich they were going to be. I know. <laughs> I, I invested in Zoom. I, so. <laughs> oh, I, I wish that I hadn't been doing volunteer work for six months when this stuff Happened and I actually had some money to invest because, yeah, I, I mean, there, there's stocks skyrocketed and for good reason. Like there, there's somebody that that tried to solve a problem that they saw in the world and did a pretty good job on it, and then that problem got huge and they got rich off of it. Like right. some of the other companies that made a bunch of money off, off of COVID is in kind of dirty, kind of nasty ways, but like. Zoom deserves every cent that they earned because they, yeah, they really have done helped a lot of people amazing connect. things. They help people connect yeah. to each other. And and, like, uh, this, this company that StreamYard is great. Uh, they do a really nice job with broadcasting. Because um, I was always doing, me and my, co- my co-host and I, we always did, we didn't really want to do visual because I like the freedom. Part of the reason why I love radio and I've done a lot is because I like, I like not always being on camera and just talking because then you go into a different realm. So mm-hmm. like you could go into like this, you know, other side of yourself. You're not self-conscious that you're like looking weird or whatever. Like I always get really self-conscious. So when you're on regular radio, you have, you can go into this like zone. And like, I think that I missed that. Like, so then we wanted it. We did, we didn't really do any visual. My, my, and I, I, all my shows are not visual. I mean, I've done people's other people's shows that are visual. Mm. So, but now we want to do more visual stuff, I guess. And obviously, I'm going to go live more for my campaigning. I have to mm-hmm. go live a lot. You know, yeah. I have to start doing that yeah. on like a daily, a weekly yeah. basis, whatever. I don't know. Did you do that? You got to show off that face. Um, <laughs> I, I tried. Um, I didn't. I, I ran a fairly unsuccessful campaign. Um, I would take very okay. few uh, pointers from the things that I actually um, did. Uh, cause I, I raised, I raised a total of $110, um, from okay. three, from three people. Uh, I did basically everything myself. I had like two people that I would have considered campaign staff. Uh, I had somebody that built my website and I had somebody else that was helping me with social media and stuff like that. Uh, he also helped me, uh, when I launched the channel mm-hmm. again during COVID. Okay. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I was just low budget just out on the street like handing out flyers um and trying to just get in front of as many people in my area as i could um i did start a youtube channel um during that and you know was putting out videos and trying to like have people on and talk to people but i i didn't go on anybody else's stuff i went on other people's like facebook lives you know but that was just like very you know, low level like lib- other libertarians that just go on Facebook Live to ramble. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I I tried to have some sort of a media presence, but I was fairly unsuccessful. <laughs> well, are you going to run again for another office? Do you believe, like in the, in the future? Um, in the in the future, yes. Um, I have decided. Uh, I was actually uh, planning to run for mayor in, this oh, year. Oh, I didn't know uh, that. Like okay. that that was that was the that was the goal while i was running for city council uh was you know kind of a a stepping stone to kind of understand how to run a campaign better you know figure out you've had to deal with the the campaign finance bureau now like that there's so many hoops and bs to jump through um even though they do they do a good job yeah we just we filed everything it's a lot of work Mm -hmm. a lot of paperwork we have to do you know yeah Um, i didn't realize how long of a process it is from being like, I want to run for office to like being able to accept your first dollar of donations. <laughs> we have a great, I have a great team. I, we're building a team. We have, a, we are like, we have like a, about 20 people on our team now and it's getting larger. So, you know, it's, it's exciting. That's awesome. It's really exciting. It's like, I, I really want to do an energized campaign. And I, what's so interesting is I, uh, 
the my, the people that are other than libertarians that I've been meeting that are they, I'm, there are a lot of Democrats and Republicans that like the policies, which really excites me to death because it's like, all right, see, it's all I'm keeping yeah. it specifically. And this is the only way, you know, people can have like slogans and that's really fun, you know, to have all that stuff. But I really want to keep it into the policy, into the substance, into the meat and the potatoes of it, even though I'm a mm-hmm. vegetarian. Like into the, into the into the meat because I think so many politicians will just be like slogan 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 and it's like what does that even mean you right. know build you back know? better <laughs> yeah build back better bigger better more whatever it's like I just I mean I have some funny slogans like I'll probably I can't say them on but most rate like New York's a city that never sleeps like better wake the fuck up you know like that's one of my slogans um wake the fuck up New York um, I love that uh that's very me it's like very New York mm-hmm. so if I could say it. You know, I think people, you know, Yorkers say fuck. We say fuck. It's the way we talk. It's the way we are. I mean, right. Um, I'm like, tell like this person, I don't play, and I'm not one to play politics. I'm like, when people ask me my opinions on very specific things, and I have very specific views on things. I don't know if they're necessarily what side of the aisle or even necessarily always libertarian views, but they're very, they're my views. And I don't right. really, um, and, I, and, and I'm willing to listen to other views and sort of, compromise to create the best policy because I know that I'm representing the entire city, not just my house, you know, not just where I live, you know, so right. I understand there's very wealthy people and there's very poor people and so, and there's middle class people. So I know that there's different needs for different communities and different economic mm-hmm. different economic levels and so I understand what what's needed or I'm looking, I, I'm, I'm learning to see what's needed because yeah. I, I, I'm not playing to one side or the other. I want everybody to be represented and to yeah. thrive in the city because I think that's a problem. People have been, you know, sort of like held back between their, the rent being very high. And I think now with the, the rents have gone down a lot in, in, mm-hmm. in the city specifically. So I think that's actually a good equalizer. That's a positive thing to happen. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, maybe not for the landlords, but some of the landlords are overcharging for rent, I think, in certain ways. They, oh, yeah. You know, you'd have an apartment, you know, 300 square feet, like $3,000, $3, you know, it's like, and it's an old, you know, disgusting apartment. So yeah. I think that way, I think they're not getting away with overcharging people to live. Um, affordable mm-hmm. housing is a very big need in New York City, specifically in Manhattan, obviously. And the boroughs, the boroughs are out pricing themselves actually now the boroughs have not gone down believe it or not as much it's manhattan that's really gone down i don't know if you're aware of that manhattan is definitely um so anyway so those are some of the things that we've been like sort of dealing with like changing like zoning and sort of like dezoning a lot of things we got to dezone i think you froze david oh there we go yeah um dezoning is very important uh because there's a lot of ridiculous zoning laws I mean, other than nature, like keeping, you know, natural resources and maybe some of the historical structure, I don't think things need to be so zoned. Yeah. We do need to keep the integrity of the beauty of the city. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I've seen it change, and that's why I say that. Yeah. I think that the idea that um, that old, that specifically just old is beautiful is is part of the the issue with uh, a lot of the neighborhoods in new york you know like uh manhattan i think has you know they've changed a lot of their their zoning laws and there's not quite as many uh like full neighborhoods that are protected but brooklyn specifically has has a whole bunch of them and you know you go into like brooklyn heights uh or like uh red hook yeah it's beautiful but they like it is impossible to change like anything there, like any construction that's going on there was a decade in the process of like getting through red tape because it's, it's almost, almost that it, the entire neighborhood of Brooklyn Heights is protected under some form of historic landmark kind of protections. Like, and like whole blocks are under one I don't know. I don't know the terminology, but like order of protection, you know, right, like know. It, it's a whole block that you just you're not allowed yeah. to touch because it's so pretty. And, you know, if you look at some like eastern cities, like eastern world, uh, you know, like uh, uh, Hong Kong or Dubai, you know, modern architecture can be beautiful. You know, if you right. look at what they are doing to. Uh, um, oh, well, uh, 
I'm going to space on this neighborhood uh, in Manhattan, all the way on the east side uh, that just uh, Hudson Yards. Uh, they just built like a couple dozen buildings over in that neighborhood. And it's the most beautiful area in the entire city. I think I think I think think there's a place for the historic buildings and there's a place for the the modern buildings. I think that Mm -hmm. that's you know, I'm saying I think that's a part of what you were saying, like like Brooklyn Heights, like it's it's really beautiful. Um, Mm -hmm. So like like but then a few blocks down it's not so <laughs> you know like fix yeah. that up i mean i think that that's a part of it too is sort of like fi- you know figuring out what could be you know dezoned and what could be you know yeah stay, you know and then there's some one house you know that they don't like i had a friend that lived in i forgot what area it was maybe Dittmas park or something she couldn't change her outside of her house like it was her you know they had to yeah. get permission for the you know well, Forest Hills Garden is also really beautiful, um, and there's some areas that definitely I, I like Preservation Society. That's what it is, the Preservation Society. That mm-hmm. definitely you don't want to, <clears throat> you know, ruin. Like mm-hmm. I, there was a house here that was um, it was a huge it was a small house and it was a huge plot of land, probably worth millions and millions of dollars. It's on the corner, and the family that lived there lived there for hundred like you know, 80 years, whatever years and mm. uh, 80 years, I think they lived there till recently. <clears throat> and uh, it was a beautiful, pristine grass, fig trees. So they sold it about two years ago and this other family bought it and they destroyed the, they destroyed it. It's like they ripped up the fig tree. It's like, then they made it into like an illegal parking garage, which, which kind of everyone just looks at it like, Ugh, and it's dirty and they have, you know, it's like, so things like that, I, I you know, it's like, it is your property and you could do it. There's got to be some sort of, you know, I don't know uh, what the answer is to something like that because it's not a parking garage, you know, it never was, but mm-hmm. you know, there's like, yeah. there's part of me that's like, want to preserve the beauty of land of the, you know, not everything needs to be built up either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> everything needs to be, you know, not everything needs right. to be a million buildings. You know, I, I think we could have some empty space. It's okay. Okay, that would be nice. We have some empty space. <laughs> yeah, I think issues like that. Uh, I like to take a book out of or a page out of JFK's book and just, uh, you know, the the answer to that question is to have somebody in office that will as- assemble all of the best opinions on this matter and figure out a, a mutually beneficial answer for everybody. That's exactly you know, what no, my no one. Is. Yeah, no one person is gonna be able to fix all the problems and if you're running for office on that kind of a mentality it's always going to end poorly i think um well, even though most people get elected on these kinds of you know trump make america great again he's going to fix every what problem mean? in america what does that mean great again like what we really you know what was i mean <laughs> were we really the, the worst great? Slogan. it was like it's, it was so I, I, people love that maga slogan and you know I just didn't think that was a great slogan because it was. It worked like, so well, and it's been. Are nostalgic. Re- yeah. I know why. Well, because there's a nostalgia that there was a time when things were easier and mm-hmm. things were like, you know, uh, like in Brooklyn where I grew up, it was like we had a great time and we had block parties and community, and now people don't know their neighbors. So I, I get that slogan why it worked so well. I mean, Trump was my landlord; mm-hmm. he was in my home. You know, growing up, he was him and his dad were in my apartment when I was a little baby. Oh wow, baby! My father, my best friends, fought. They all knew the Trumps very well, as we were in the seventies. So Ooh. I have a connection to the Trumps. Might want to be friends. careful saying that. <laughs> no, I mean I don't. I'm not. But they were our landlord. They were the landlord. Oh, you know? conspiracy theory, a brew. <laughs> <laughs> They're the landlords, um, but they. They were, you know, like my dad knew Fred. Uh, Donald would like be annoying. That's what my mother said. This would be, and you know, they, my parents used to go to their casino all the time. It wasn't like, you know, he wasn't, you know, he was just a, you know, I, I had friends on the, the Apprentice and stuff, and when they, Lisa Lampanelli was on that. You know, it was a different world before he became president. So he was just a, you know, he was like a reality store rich guy. You know, <laughs> right? Uh, I think the i think that an interesting move for the republican party right now would be to kind of play off of that that nostalgic view of trump that still exists in new york uh 
And, no, it's not and, <laughs> well, it, 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 it exists a little bit, but I think uh, running someone like Ivanka for mayor would be a very interesting move that I think would it would it would be a step outside of the box that the because the Republican Party is a joke in New York City, right? Like people they, they run them out. Yeah, they don't even yeah. I think they Trump Tower. I wonder what's going to happen there. I don't I mean, <laughs> I have a lot of friends that support him and, you know, and some mm -hmm. of my supporters support him. So I don't want to, you know, I, I don't personally like him for a lot of different reasons, you know, but same for me, I'm allowed to feel that way, but I have personal reasons why I don't like, I have more personal than political reasons that I don't want to get into right now, but um, it's more personal from things that happened to friends of mine. And, you know, I'm, I've been in entertainment for many years and I've known people that work with him on the other end. So mm -hmm. I have other reasons. So I, it, you know, uh, I just I wish I he, I wish he could have been more for the people, mm -hmm. and 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 really broken up the pol political nonsense. Yeah, like in a that would way, have been nice. after himself, that would have really, if he really really been like always for the people, always for the people. I think I would have liked him better. Yeah, I I'm a I was a fan of like 2015 Trump, <laughs> like early 2015, like Republican primary. Trump was I mean he was he was a he was a racist bigot but like I was I was okay with some like some of the stuff he was saying you know he he campaigned on a an almost libertarian platform until yeah, he had to like shift yeah. hard right against uh when he entered the general he played the politics right he uh, which would have been that would have been politics I don't know how he got it the christian right on him so like meanwhile he everything in his life is anti-christian so i will never understand that i actually got into an argument i came home uh just before christmas because i actually spent christmas in new hampshire uh with tulsi's campaign so i came home like two weeks beforehand and we had like a pre-christmas and exchanged gifts um and i went to i went back to my childhood church uh because the church my parents were going to had a new pastor that I didn't like. Uh, and I got into an argument with this gentleman at my church because I he asked me what I was doing. And I said that I was working for Tulsi. He freaked out because she's a Democrat. And and I asked and I, I played my part. You know, I was I kind of put my campaign hat on and then switched into, you know, be very cordial, like actually try to change this guy's mind, try to flip this vote. Um, and so I was asking him like why he supports Trump and his only thing was because he's pro-life and I'm but like is he really pro-life? <laughs> like I, and I looked him dead in the eyes and I was like I can promise you that Tulsi has had less abortions than Donald Trump <laughs> I know that's a fact. I know for a fact. <laughs> so, so, and, and he, he just, he kept going. It's all, oh, it's all about the Supreme Court. And I was like, and this was post Kavanaugh. Uh, I was like, he, the two, the, he's appointed two Supreme Court justices that have both said that they'll uphold Roe v. Wade. So, and then, then he went on to appoint a third one who said the same thing. So where, where is the evangelical, I think right, I, getting their support for Trump. I don't understand it. I, I will the never understand. They're actually very fair. They've been. I mean, I, more. I was surprising how fair they've been. They've been very neutral. And they're, like, yeah. they're, geniuses. they're probably all geniuses, and they probably think with just the law at hand and the Constitution, they're not judging with their own emotions. You can't be a Supreme Court judge with an agenda. Am I correct? Like, I you you're not supposed to be. They all get appointed with an agenda, though, and it's a it's one of the multiple things that's deteriorated on American politics based off like compared to how it's supposed to, judge to be. and not be new and be the you know follow the law. So this is the mm -hmm. law. You know, um, you have to determine whether it's constitutional or not as a Supreme Court, and then, but you know, uh, the new who's the what's the woman saying the newest? Uh, uh, Amy Amy Coney Barrett. People don't like her. I, 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 I don't I know. I love her. I, I think she's, she's awesome. I think she's, yeah. I mean, I was like, she's very conservative and people, I think she seems like a genius. And I mean, maybe people mm -hmm. are going to be like, I'm wrong. I don't know. But I, I, she seems like she's very confident and very logical. And I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not particularly conservative at all. I'm not at all, actually. Yeah. I'm very 
neutral, a very centrist. And I, I think maybe I'm wrong. We'll see what happens in the future that, that, you know, if, as long as, you know, if I think she's going to be very much by the books and Mm -hmm. use her logical brain. And I don't think there's going to be much. Yeah. When, when the Supreme court unanimously voted to throw out the Trump's case, uh, challenging the election was the moment where I like actually kind of regained a little bit of confidence in the American structure, like the way that we do government, because it was a, it's a six, three conservative majority. Like if, if the, the judges played politics, the way that everyone expected them to, uh, we would be in the middle of a Supreme court case, uh, just deciding the election. Um, and it would like crazy well, things know, would be happening it's against the law. I think I was reading someone was explaining law to me that I was watching this YouTube thing. And, you know, obviously uh, this guy, he's a law student or was a law student. And he was saying that it's illegal for a state to sue another state over their election. It's mm-hmm. not legal. It's not in the constitution to do that. Yeah. It's a, it's a correct, really weird me, but you can't thing that, that we're trying to do. Yeah. I, there's, I've heard a lot of things from like hardcore Republicans over the last couple of weeks, you know, Twitter's a, Twitter's a dumpster fire of bullshit. Um, but I've heard a lot of theories about like how Trump could still win the election. Um, and, and I don't, I don't understand where like most of these people are coming from. I understand a decent amount of, of about election law because i am a nerd that went and dug into it especially when we thought that there might be a tie when cnn and fox were both projecting states in the in a way where like it looked like it was going to be a tie uh mm-hmm. me and my one of my best friends zach uh like really dug into how that works and we were both like rooting for it and started like a whole twitter campaign about like team tie because um, it would have been great that would have been in my opinion the best case scenario for the 2020 election it would have been a dead tie because it would have gone to the house all the democrats would have been super happy because they're like hey we control the house and then they all would have had to have read up on election law for a minute and realized that the way that it, the house votes on the presidential election is each state gets one vote and oh, all of the con- all the congress people from each state vote and whatever whoever wins the st- each state then gets that vote there are tw- i think 29 or 30 uh republican delegations and oh, yeah wow. 20 or 21 democratic ones you know the, i mean if you look at the election map you know it's all, there's always more red than blue um but because we have the electoral college that's what evens that out when we go to a delegation vote in the house there's nothing to even that out and north dakota matters just as much as new york they each right. get one vote so the republicans would have won in a landslide <laughs> interesting that's interesting i didn't think about that that's interesting yeah. I had I had a lot of Democratic friends on on Facebook and Twitter that were like, "Yeah, Team Ty, that would be okay because we'd still win." I'm like, well, that nope. yeah. So what, what what Trump was claim what Trump was claiming with the fraud and all that stuff, so no one would have been elected. Like, so all the Democrats and Republican senators that were reelected or elected. I mean, there are people that don't right go down the ballot. Some people like switch around the ballot. Like I do that mm-hmm. too. I'm a very like. Oh, I like this guy better than this guy, even though, you know, I, I'm, that's how I am. Some people go that's, straight down. That's how everyone should be. If you vote yeah, straight I mean, down on any line, even the libertarian line, I think you might want to question how you do voting. Yeah, I, I like certain people in different parties for different reasons. So, um, like, if you're an animal rights person, I'm going to vote for you. It's like one of my strong, you know, so, and if you're not, then I will probably vote. So anyway, so I, I think that, you know, every vote, including Joe Jorgensen's vote and, you know, like those votes would have been like, how do you count for those votes? So those like, fraud, you know, so so that means like so I was quoting the Palmer report, you know, Bob, I saying that that means no one was elected. So, you you know, if this to be true, then that also has to be true. It can't just be like the whole election. So every, you know, Mitch McConnell's reelection would be, you know, that would be great. Ride. That'd be great. He's like the evil, you know, everybody's left. Whoever was, Give you know, Brad Barron another shot. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he was like ridiculous. He's, I don't know why, who keeps electing that man, but you know, uh, 
he's not, you know, and Kentucky is not a rich, you know, there was a huge, rich amount of wealthy people, but it's not, a, it's a poor state. It's yeah. bad. It's not. What I don't understand is that the same people that keep reelecting Mitch McConnell keep reelecting Rand Paul. <laughs> like, how are they senators from the same state? I don't understand it. And and the fact that Thomas Massey won his reelection, even his Republican primary against a Trumpy candidate, he got 83% of the vote. Like, somehow these people are voting for Thomas Massey and Rand Paul and then also being like, yeah, Mr. McConnell's cool too. Yeah, like, well, I, I, maybe talk what? about election fraud. I mean, uh, you know, like that, like, like, I like to look at that, like, th those, like, I don't know whose mm -hmm. hand he has in the de devil's hand. You know, he's a, he's a weird one. But, um, okay. yeah, I don't know how people keep getting reelected. It doesn't make sense. So that's, you know, so it's like, it's like, so that to be true, then the, you know, then I guess there's fraudulent theories about how, why that would, no, you're the people, he didn't win that period. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. Mitch McConnell wouldn't have won otherwise, you know, or other mm -hmm. people. I don't even know. Yeah. Yeah, and even if you wanna, even if you wanna pick and choose, oh, there was only fraud in specific states, which I think is probably something that could be said truthfully, because um, there there would be no reason to really tr do anything that could get you caught in a state like North Dakota or New York or California. Like <laughs> it's not it's not necessary. Um, right. So there could be I could hear an argument for counting some of those states out, but there were still what seven or eight states on the list of where they they think that there was fraud um that includes texas and michigan well texas uh, one, uh, texas yeah um they still think that there was a whole bunch of fraud there because it was too close of an election i would have loved to see texas go blue that would have been really weird. i that mean i think now awesome. people are moving down there a lot of People from like blue states are moving down south because mm -hmm. of the weather and the pandemic. So it's it'll go blue in twenty two. I mean, I I'm, think, I'm, I'll make that projection right now. That I they'll think have a democratic governor. I think we knew we need new politicians coming through, specifically in the Senate. We need like young uh, people that are more centrist on both ends and sort of you know. I mean, it's okay to have your views. I think there. I think we need people that are really going to represent what's out there. I don't think people are so polarized, really. I mean, right. it's weird because people will polarize each other during the elections, but then when I speak to them one on one, it's like, oh, we have the same views about so many different things. Right. So I don't really understand why people vote against their own interests too. Mm -hmm. It's. I mean, that. Yeah, that comes down to unfortunately, like basic human psychology of that you know people respond better to anger than than most other uh things you know that's the same reason that social media algorithms work the way that they do uh they've found psychologically that people are more likely to interact with something that pisses them off than something that they like you know you post uh uh like super politically charged something or like a puppy picture and you know, you're going to get you're, you'll see that yeah you might get a whole bunch of likes on the puppy picture but you'll get like seven comments max you post something that's like trump is a godsend and you're going to get a hundred and some odd comments like crazy, guaranteed people. yeah crazy. Uh, you're crazy you crazy <laughs> right I, mean, I, I like it's funny cuz like let's say he had, he had some great policies like like i remember like during when the Congress wouldn't vote for three hundred dollars for the extra bump, and he got it for people, like I was like, "Oh, that was great! He did that, you know." And but then he created like chaos, and when you create chaos in a very uncertain time, it makes it, it's not good. It's not good, but agreed. Cool. I mean, so a lot of his policies, like he be, he is a malignant narcissist, like by definition, he's a malignant narcissist. And I studied narcissism, <laughs> like like. I know nar what narcissism is. I've studied it in school. I, I've studied it, you know, in like in bo on books. And I'm very attuned to narcissism and, you know, and, and that whole like cluster B personality type because I've had friends, very close friends that are diagnosed cluster B, which is like borderline uh, narcissism, psychopathy mm -hmm. and sociopathy. And so he fits the narcissistic playbook to the T. Oh, yeah. And what happens in a narcissist relationship in a personal level, this is interesting, is that people become like bonded and they get gas like gaslighted and trauma bonded. So mm -hmm. trauma bonding is the up and the down that people have been, you know, and so 
they can't like and some of the people that like him like can't accept the fact that he may not be the greatest person like to to to, to like like somebody so much like i would never like a politician so much that i didn't know personally seriously like mm-hmm. i don't would never want that sicko fan type of relationship with anybody like it's not normal like i don't have that with biden i don't have that with tulsi gal and she's great but i don't know her yeah. personally i don't have that with bernie i don't have that with anybody you know mm-hmm. Mitch mcconnell <laughs> i don't have that with anybody uh maybe larry sharp because i know him anyway but um yeah yeah i was gonna say you like larry and tulsi i know i consider uh them personal friends to a level that i'm okay with being a sycophant a little bit right they're and, my friends and i called and i'll call larry out um I've called him out a couple of times. Um, I actually got, he pissed him off uh, in a group chat the other day. Um, but but, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, we, we've, we'll move past it. We always do. Uh, it's politics. Sometimes people disagree. I've, that's, I called well, Tulsi out to her face on her gun policy, uh, oh, really? as well as uh, one of my very good friends, Reed gave her like a, a letter in an envelope. Like it was like an 11 page letter about why, her gun policy is wrong and why she should change it. And if you paid attention to her campaign in like end of December, beginning of January, she removed basically every like gun control talking point from her website, from her Twitter, from her speeches, everything. Yeah. She actually changed her mind a little bit. She, cause I think she was pandering to the left with most of it, um, which is politics. Uh, everyone panders a little bit. Um, she, I think she thought that because she was running in a Democratic primary, the only way that she could win is if she said guns are scary. And we showed her uh, that she had a lot of support that would have gotten even stronger if she dropped that. And so she did. And, you know, she didn't win New Hampshire. And I think it was because she had pushed the gun control thing for too long. If she had dropped it sooner, she could have won New Hampshire. Like New Hampshire is a purple state that still voted almost unanimously on constitutional carry like, really? and signed into law by a democratic governor. Like they, even the Democrats up there like their guns. Well, I think that different <laughs> states have different, you know, like yeah. in New York, the, the gun laws are very strict here. Oh, yeah. So I think people are, should be allowed to legally own a gun, you know, legally. And, but we have a lot of le- illegal guns here. We just do. It's it's oh, you yeah. know. And I think that people want need to learn how to safely own a gun in New York and not be afraid. But well, you know, I don't think people should be taking on the subway because. Mm. <laughs> but then yeah. again, you know, you know, because you know people snap very easily in New York. <laughs> right. You know, there's a difference. You know, it, but I think that people. I think we can ease up on certain types of laws. Like this is a funny story. Um, so many years ago, one of my this is a really kind of Hollywood funny story. One of my best friends was Drew Barrymore's mom. She played my my aunt in Grandma Sylvie's funeral. We became very close, and she used to carry a gun, but she never told me that. Like she had a pocketbook. I'm, like I wish I could show you if I had my pocketbook around. She would have a her, her purse, and she just threw the gun in. Like you know, you throw a pocket, a hairbrush, lipstick, and her gun. And I didn't know this until one day. <laughs> <laughs> this is the funny story ever. We're walking down. <laughs> You're gonna appreciate the story. So we're walking down, like I don't know. It was like dark. It was like midtown. It wasn't such a great area, and we thought we we're being followed. And, it, and she used to wear like heels this high, you know. We used to, and we were coming from like a nightclub or some, you know, some like show busy party. And she's like, "Stacy, don't worry." I said, "Why?" And then she opens her bag, and she pulls out this little pistol. I'm like, "What?" <laughs> So, so I was like, oh, okay. Meanwhile, like, you know, at times we were like, and I don't think she was like carrying it correctly. I don't know how the proper carrying is, but I know you're not supposed to throw it in your bag. Like just throw it in your bag. And who knows how old it was. So, um, this gets funnier. So then, uh, she like, you know, she used to throw her bag. Like we used to go to parties, you know, people throw their pocketbooks on the the bed and the coats and whatever. So I'm like thinking how many times we laid on her bag and like it could have went off. Who knows? You know? So then she's, this is gets really crazy. She's postering. This is like a year or two later. She's post her ex-boyfriend was a musician and she's postering up like, you know, come see him play at the blah, blah, blah lounge. And the c- cops stopped them, you know, because of this postering. It was illegal, you know, to do that. Now I don't think anyone would care, but that's the least of our problems. 
So right. back to the nineties. So they were postering up and she got like arrested or something and they opened her bag and her handgun was illegal and she ended up in jail. It was a huge, then she had to do community service. Oh my she gosh. Had, like, I was, I, I was so weird because we'd have cell phones. So she couldn't get in touch with me. I was staying at a friend's house. So I was almost going to have to bail her out of jail, but she got the Mayflower madam to husband to bail her out of jail. And then she had to go and she was doing community service for like months and months. Like she was in jail, but I mean, she got the charges down, but she'd never had a crime like that. But it was a big crime. Like it was a big, yeah. it, was, it was unregistered or she took it from California. I don't know. It was like, I don't oh, wish yeah. she got the gun, but it was a big, <laughs> it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. It was like, I mean, she's not a violent criminal. So she was like working for the department of the, of the blind or whatever it's called. I think the, she was doing something with paperwork for them for, like months and months. Like it was like hmm. an office job, but it was, it was really crazy. I remember that. I mean, is she somebody that's like a danger? No. Was she carrying it incorrectly? Yes. That was the number one mm -hmm. thing. She should have carried it correctly. It was not right. in a holster. It was just sitting in her bag with her hairbrush. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that is definitely a problem. And like any gun activist, uh, like, uh, even like the, the, the far right ones that I disagree with, they're all pretty good on, on the, dance of you know we need to educate people on proper carrying proper usage and you know i the reason that uh like gun misfires within the activist community are so rare is because we're all ridiculously careful like i'm raised i was raised by a marine sniper i knew gun safety before i knew how to tie my shoes that's not even a joke <laughs> like i um and like, yeah, I grew up in, in a very like gun centric society out in the country where, you know, you get together and go shoot in somebody's backyard. That's that's a thing that you do as a fun thing where I'm from. Right. So uh, there's definitely uh, I, when I go to or when I moved to New York, I understood the the left's fear of guns a lot more because i understood how uneducated people really were on it well we never uh, were told we didn't have guns in my you know in brooklyn right. you know, the bad people had guns like the bad right. criminals you mm -hmm. know and they were normally illegal guns and they were guns that were but anything could be a weapon like guns are a deadly weapon they should be treated like that with reverence mm -hmm. that they're deadly just like a car could be a deadly weapon right and you to learn how to use one properly and succinctly and i think that's a very important thing when it comes mm -hmm. to guns and that's yeah i think the more education um i think it's important to learn like in israel they go to the army mm -hmm. and i know that they go to the army when they're 18 and they learn how to shoot guns and you know and then they, they have an education for it you know i think yeah. what people are fearful of is these like you know these parkland type shootings or these you know, mm -hmm. uh, Sandy Hook, whatever, those types of things. And how do you avoid those things? Or mm -hmm. Las Vegas, you know, those, I don't think that has anything to do with guns. That could have been bombs. It could have been mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. I, I mean, we just saw in New Hampshire, or in uh, um, Nashville, uh, yeah, uh, how deadly not guns can be. Um, and that's a very gun-centric society. You know, I, you've been, I'm sure you've been to Nashville. Uh, there's yeah. guns everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> going to a bar, chose, everyone's strapped. He chose his RV. I mean, I mean, so anything is a, is a weapon. Uh, now people are worried. How do you get, how do you prevent like crazy people from getting illegal guns? Like that's something that where someone snaps and shoots their whole family. It's mm -hmm. like, that's, that's one of the fears that people have. But they could also, yeah. you know, take the gas and like put them, you know, put them to sleep when they get from the stove. So I mean, right. there's different. I mean, it's 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 a very it's a but touchy subject. Plenty ways to murder your family. That's so. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah, it's a touchy subject. There's plenty subject. of ways to murder your whole family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very it easy. Definitely, and there's there's two cultures that I <laughs> there's two cultures that I've uh, interacted with that have made me change my or not change my stance on guns. I'm still like as as crazy Second Amendment as you could probably get. I'm the kind of person that believes that we should be able to own recreational rocket launchers and tanks because the second amendment was written to defend against a tyrannical government not really anything else uh so we should be able to have whatever they can have but 
uh, New York and Hawaii cultures are drastically different, but are both anti-gun for their, uh, for the same reason, a lack of education. But because in Hawaii, people don't, uh, people don't need stuff like that. The culture there is peaceful. People leave their doors unlocked, even even in the cities. Um, there, I mean, not that crime is completely non-existent in Hawaii, but it's violent crime is significantly lower. You know, even burglaries happen almost always when nobody's home. You know, it's just it's just a different culture and very like conflict avoidant culture. So the the like have to protect yourself mentality just isn't there as much. And then New York, you have the exact opposite where everyone's so like conflict ridden always that it's the idea of like the person next to you on the subway being able to shoot everyone is very terrifying because yeah. you've seen people freak out and go crazy on the subway so that that idea that is a problem it's a huge problem yeah yeah uh so but i think you know the answer to that i don't think is well let's just pretend guns don't exist no, they uh, exist I, I, right. think, I think a business owner should have that protection for mm -hmm. instance you know you know someone comes to your business and tries to rob you you should be able to protect yourself right yeah there's definitely a, a need to protect yourself in a, especially in a city like new york uh but i think you know you asked how do, how do we make sure that like crazy violent criminals don't get their hands on illegal guns and i think that conversation is fairly similar to the drugs conversation like how, do, how can we make sure that 12 year olds don't get their hands on weed it's make it legal make it something that you have to go to a store and show an identification and and uh you know maybe i'm not the biggest fan of like government background checks but in a city like new york that's gonna have to happen um you know make sure that the people that are getting it should be right. able to get it um and if you make that a legal market the people that are selling are going to be much more inclined to make sure that the people that they're selling it to aren't doing dumb shit with it it's, it's the exact same with alcohol and drugs and guns in my opinion right i mean it's all i mean people make choices like i'm not a big weed smoker i never liked it I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm allergic to cbd i throw up when i get cbd Ooh. but i'm not de i'm not denying other people of it um i mean i th you know we also one of my platforms is to decriminalize prostitution because it takes it out of the dark like you said and and that yeah. is a huge problem because people are being trafficked um if people are held accountable you know and it's between two people that are consenting you know you're able to catch people that are, that are non-consenting because that you find the mm -hmm. you know they no longer are under the people don't have to work for um another person or be, I, I think one of the clauses would be is that someone needs to work as an independent contractor if they're going to be a sex worker that particular industry i would that's what i would put into the into the into law because rather than working this way they don't get pimped out <laughs> that's kind of mm -hmm. how i feel um, i think that that that's great i i feel like that's something most of the the activists in that community would be would agree with as well um the ones that understand the the business difference between an employee and a contractor and the escort and if you have an escort service you know this i would definitely ha be very weary in terms of who's owning it and how they're w running their business and that that's mm -hmm. that would be one of my concerns because that's you know you know working for myself and you know picking out my own clients if i was a sex worker would be mm -hmm. very different than me picking someone else picking out my clients am i am i being so that's where there's yeah. the blurry line that I would want to really protect the worker, you mm -hmm. know, as well. Yeah, I think until we can make sure, you know, incremental steps in the direction of freedom is, I think, sh should be most people's goal in the liberty movement. And so some kind of government control over this, making sure that this is done safely until we can mitigate the wide variety of issues in this industry that exist right now is i think the the only way to to move forward you know we until we can completely end human trafficking uh having some kind of regular government regulatory system over this making sure that it's it's happening safely is common sense because people aren't going like also the whole you know thing with like you know 
sex workers using drugs and not being aware of what they're doing. That's also an issue. So yes. um, there would have to be something around that so they wouldn't be taken. Like, just like it's rape if you someone has sex with you when you're on con. It's the same thing. They, right. they have, sex workers need to have the same exact, you know, protections as non-sex workers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's fair. Yeah. I have, uh, there's, uh, I call, I, I call them the, the mini squad. There's a group of, uh, New York state politicians, uh, from the city that are all kind of like DSA. Um, and, uh, one of them is, uh, assemblywoman from Chinatown, uh, Yulin New, I believe. I don't know. I actually know how to pronounce her last name. Um, but she, uh, tells a story. Uh, she used to work for, uh, a congressman before she got elected and was working in his office and had this woman come in uh just uh both both black eyes black and blue uh giant like scar down her face um oh just God. just wrecked um came into the office um and said that uh a cl that she was she was a sex worker and, and a client had uh, was unhappy with her service apparently and uh, had done this to her and she didn't go to the cops because she would have gotten arrested. Like she had to go to a congressman's office and try to like ask this 21 year old, uh, this is staff assistant <laughs> for help instead of going to the people who you, you should be going to because it's criminalized. Is it, uh, is it, um, will they, would they arrest somebody coming in that was beaten? I don't think they would. I, don't think I mean, they, I, I don't know that they would have, but that was her feeling. She was, she was scared. I think she was also, um, an undocumented immigrant. Uh, so they would have like just any kind of interaction with the police is bad in, in her area. But, uh, it, the, I think that's the trafficking issue. People are afraid to come to the police because they're afraid they're going to go get them back to wherever they're from. Mm -hmm. I think there needs to be some sort of protection for victims of crime, no matter yeah. what their issue is. I, I, I don't know if that's. I think I don't know if that's in law. I would assume that New York would have that law. I'd like to check on that. Um, I mean, as it stands right now, uh, in New York law, uh, a victim of sex trafficking that uh, engages in prostitution is a criminal well that uh, yeah that's which that is awful you, you got to do that anyway yeah yeah we're we're busting up uh sex well, trafficking rings not catching the person that was actually doing it and just locking up a bunch of hookers and calling it a success and that yeah that's that's I mean, that, very 1990 <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's uh it's terrible it's it's awful what what they're considering and because they get to say oh we arrested x amount of people for do doing x crime that we're a successful branch of the nypd and should continue to get funding and more funding and continue to just well, do this thing that, instead that of actually helping people yeah that's not helping anybody because whoever's you know if those half those women aren't even from new york and they were trafficked in that's a crime from the other from the pimp or whatever it was forcing yeah. them to work and if they were they working on their own volition were they forced were they here paying off a debt that's a very common thing people you know are, are, put, are brought here and they have to pay a debt off mm -hmm. by working in that and that happens also in waitering too like it happens in other types of fields i think um who was telling me this the other day it, ha it happens like in just plain waitressing jobs and like mm -hmm. some of these uh, restaurants and uh, ethnic restaurants in Jackson Heights, like different ethnicities uh, or different, you know, different uh, Ecuadorian or some, some, something like that. There was like waiters, wait, you know, working off debt because they were brought here. Yeah, um, that. And doesn't or nail surprise salon, me, unfortunately. And nail salon, nail salon workers as well. I've, mm -hmm. I've gone to nail salons and the girls are very young and something's off about the way they're working. I could tell mm -hmm. by the way they, they interact with the customers. There isn't, isn't right. And then yeah. I've gone to nail salons where it's a total opposite. You could tell that they've trained and they're very excited to be, you know, doing their job and they're mm -hmm. very good at what they do. So I see, I've seen it you know, more a couple of years ago when I lived in a story. I saw a lot of, I said, how do you get to work? Oh, we take a bus. We all take a bus together. It's the way... She described the way she worked 
the way she came into yeah, that's that sketchy. job. Uh, and she was young. That's why I asked her. She was extremely young. She probably should have mm-hmm. been in high school at the time. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, how do you, do you live near here? She was always oh, took a bus together and she didn't want to tell me much. So, I, so it happened in other professions. Mm-hmm. You know, prostitution is, is obviously sexual, but it's also in other jobs, you know, like yeah. it's, it's slave labor, slave labor, you know, mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah. So that happens often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have, I have, um, a, a few friends actually that are um, sex workers that, you know, are very adamant on the, uh, the difference between, you know, consensual work and non-consensual work, regardless of what field it's in. Um, because yeah, any being forced to do anything, you know, it's a violation of the non-aggression principle. It's a violation of human rights in general, you know, needs to, needs to be stopped. And, treating sex work differently and criminalizing uh, participating in it consensually is only making it harder for them to stop the non-consensual things you know what we're talking about here you know they're they're able to to break up these these nail salons and these restaurants so much easier because the people that are there uh, being forced to work are able to go to the police and say hey this is happening. Can you make it stop happening? And the police are do their job. But uh, yeah. people that are that were brought here and forced into the field of sex work, they're just unable to do that. Unable, absolutely unable. So, and and then they're forced to do other jobs. So, I think any forced labor is a form of you know pimping. So, yeah, any forced labor, sexual mm-hmm. or non, mm-hmm. it could be waitering, it could be you know you know, working in the fields, it could be anything. So, yeah, for sure. Know. So that's something that I'd like to stop in New York. Cause that's also a problem. Mm-hmm. It's also a really bad problem. It's yeah. not just the sex work trafficking, it's human trafficking for other types of work. And that's a really big problem. And it's no one looks at it because it's not illegal to be a waiter, but or mm-hmm. a nail salon worker or something. But if you right. are being forced to do it to pay a debt off, that needs to stop. For sure. Um, so I'm curious, I know this is like a, a very long term question, but in, in the hypothetical world um, where you win next year um, and you serve three terms as mayor and you can't you can't be mayor anymore. Uh, where where do you think you would want to go from there? Hmm. I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, I'd like to work probably in federal government as a senator or a representative of some sort probably senator i'd run for state senator i think awesome would be my next move if i'm not burnt out by being mayor for three terms (laughs) it would be fun to be mayor for three terms i mean i think it'd be a great way to you know to to serve the city that i grew up Mm -hmm. in and live in for my whole life and watch it grow and come back to Mm -hmm. and, and thrive again and be, you know, one of my ideas I was thinking with uh, about was like, I I think that having more pop up stores, like small, like where you can where businesses, and this is an idea, especially now, where uh, normally you wouldn't be able to have this kind of business because you wouldn't have enough money to to sort of like dev- you know work with landlords to create you know little mini stores. So like you mm-hmm. you sell your crafts or your mustard or your you know, or whatever thing you make and like have people be able to, to have their own little stores uh, in New York and that would bring diversity, it would bring, you know, capitalism mm-hmm. back in a healthy way and people <laughs> have their own businesses selling amazing little products and offering people these, you know, delicious like craft artisan, you know, type foods and or just crafts in general or just or, or products, you know, that they could sell that they that are just amazing. So I think that's something I'm, I'm working on figuring out how to work with the landlords. There's so many empty spaces. So mm-hmm. rather than having one business, you know, take a huge space up that can't af- maybe afford it, have a few different businesses share the space and make that easier mm-hmm. for them. Like co-op the spaces, so to speak. That would be awesome. Um, yeah, that's my new, one of my revitalization, revitalization, revitalization plans. I love Why it. <laughs> revitalization. Yeah. Sure like, like, <laughs> <laughs> revitalization. Revitalization. Uh, revitalization. Yeah. 
revitalization. There we go. Uh, yeah, I think you know, New York could use uh, could use some revitalization. That is for sure. Um, yeah, I think we've we've given up on politics as a society, you know, almost nationally. But um, I've, I saw it a lot in New York, where you know politicians are the bad guys and they're just not going to work for the people. And like, you have a couple of people, you know, Jumani Williams, I think is, is a good example of a, of a New York city politician that actually cares about the people that he serves. Um, and you know, but he's not able to accomplish much cause he gets outvoted always. Um, and we just kind of are like, yeah, the, the po- politicians aren't gonna, aren't going to be able to do this. And people like you come along and and give great ideas and they still just dismiss it out of because oh well you know paul if if you actually believe that you're not going to succeed in politics so you know voting for you is, is a wasted vote or something some not variation of that it's not but, a way i i, I want to convince people that voting third party or independent is not a wasted vote i think that right. I want to bring people in to the movement. Like we're a movement now and we're going to create a, a, a movement and we're not playing the same old politics. We're New York is better than that. So yeah, and we're more diverse than that. So I'd like to stress to people, look at policy, 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 see if it aligns with your values. And that would be the best way to vote. Like don't just vote on party lines, vote on policy. I want to like, Tell people that because I think that's what's missing now. Mm-hmm. Or don't just go on one issue. Like, look at the whole picture. Right. You know, how do you want to see your city? Mm-hmm. I think that's important. Do you want to see city thriving with diverse like businesses and you know lack you know not corporatized or do you want you know l- like we want it less corporatized? That's I think what what ruined Manhattan and 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 the, and the five mm-hmm. boroughs mostly Manhattan when it became like Disney World. Mm-hmm. Like we do want less crime. Let's take away the crime, right? Yeah. Obviously, crime went up, and we need to to, to work. But it doesn't have to be Disney World. It's not either Disney mm. World or crime. You know. Right. You know, we could kind of have a, like a no crime, but like we kind of want like a more uh di- like like the parts of New York that were always wonderful mm-hmm. without the crime. Right. You know, there's always that little seediness about it, which made it fun. As long as mm-hmm. no one gets hurt, you know that I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a bad thing i think you need some character we need to bring we lost a lot of character over the years we, we sterilized yeah. the city too much I, I think that's what happened i think now we went so far the other way with the pandemic so now we can come back a little bit and meet it in the middle so mm-hmm. we can have you know not have it so sterile and disney-like and like um nothing's wrong with having a little bit of that you know but we don't yeah. need it Times square didn't need to be like vegas it didn't need that it needed to have more like uh, different types of businesses and not so click kitschy. It, it wasn't fun anymore. We lost its fun. And I think yeah. New York, one of the things about New York, which I realized being someone who went to nightclubs and went out a lot and really utilized the city for this most, you know, of the arts and of the nightlife, I think the city needs to come back to being fun again. It was a place to come and have a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. We have to have like the roaring 20s, 2020. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the roaring yeah. 20s should back yeah that's one of my i mean you know coming from the comedy world and from you know the the arts i think that's really important to bring that back uh Mm -hmm. not only broadway we're bringing back speakeasy culture so that's part of the the roaring 20s we're bringing back thanks to covid we have we have speakeasies again because it's illegal to have a bar so you have to have secret bars that's been happening yeah (laughs) that's that's a step in the right direction of like adding that CD character back to New York. I think right. yeah. speakeasies are my favorite part of New York. Um, we still like have bar them. culture. Yeah. It's, I like, yeah, I think we should, we have to have that again and in, in a, you know, a fun way. And I think we're, lo- we lost that a little bit mm-hmm. um, over the years. I saw it at my, with my own eyes. Like I, I saw it like, Oh, like this is not fun anymore. Like, and I think that there's a way to create that again. You know, um, mm-hmm. after this pandemic, health over because it seems like it's going on for a long time. You know, yeah, almost it'll be a year and a few, like three months, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, two weeks to slow the spread. <laughs> it actually, I think it's a three-week cycle. I've noticed when the numbers go up, it's always three weeks. 
Mm-hmm. So we, the numbers will go up three weeks, and then they go down. They should go up. So you know. So and then there's then you know there's a whole new thing of cases. Uh, you know, I don't know. I like to ha- bring more medical professionals into the city and more medical centers. So. Mm-hmm. The hospitals aren't overwrought. Like it's all the five boroughs. I know there's not enough beds in Queens, and then people are complaining about that. Mm-hmm. So we need more, you know, really good hospitals. I think. Yeah. So I think yeah. that would a lot. To yeah, we need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You know, we need to to solve this problem. You know, bring the bring the medical ship back and use it this time. Um, you know, the the kind of pop up medical centers that we've have built. Um, you know, continue to do that. But we also need to build like two or three more hospitals in New York. Oh, you know, just permanent fixtures because this mm-hmm. is this is a problem that we have regularly. LA um, is another city that has it worse, you know. Um, LA General uh, reaches capacity almost daily. Like it is, yeah. it is rare for them to have empty beds. And there's a, plenty of hospitals in New York where it's fairly similar culture where um you know i've spent hours in a hallway in a new york city hospital yeah, because horrible. there's just there are no rooms uh so and there's no reason some- for it we have the we have you know so many empty office spaces now and you know i think that we need to start building hospitals where if you go to an emergency room you're not there for hours and hours for something small that you can come in and out within an hour to two hours and be like, you know, you know, as long as it, you know, you're treated, you're treated yeah. or if you have to be admitted, but I'm saying if no one should be waiting for hours and hours to get sewn up, you know, like a finger boo boo or something, you know, mm-hmm. like, like it's, it's ridiculous. You know, I've been, yeah. I've been, you know, in Connecticut, I've been to places and it's not like that, you know, other States I've been to mm-hmm. where you don't, you're not in for hours and hours and everything's a, you know, a lot of times you'll get, um, They'll release you. That happened to my mom. They released her, you know, early, and then she had to come back a day later, and then we had to wait in the emergency room for nine more hours. Like, mm-hmm. that shouldn't. That's not how. That's the, how do you do that? How yeah. can we change that system? It doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. Yeah, I I went to um, Mount Sinai in uh, uh, Flatbush area uh, with my ex because um, I I threw her onto the bed and her foot hit the wall and she kneed herself in the face and busted open her eyebrow. Um, and we were there for almost five hours. Oh my um, God. Like th- this happened at like three or four in the morning and we were there well after sunup. It was like almost noon by the time we got back to the, my apartment. Uh, and wow. just to, just to stitch up an eyebrow. Uh, and that's one of like the kind of smaller, like better hospitals in New York. You know, I've been in and out of there fairly mm-hmm. quickly before, but you know, even even the ones in the outer boroughs are problematic in this way, and it makes people discouraged to go to the hospital and fix the things that are wrong with them, and then they get worse, and then we just have a culture of people that are just like, yeah, my knee just does that. It, do- it doesn't bend anymore. <laughs> I just I just walk kind of crooked, and that's just me now. And there's people like that. You know, I've met multiple people like that. You know, I've started to be like that in a couple of ways, you know, of just like, yeah, my shoulder just kind of pops in and out of socket sometimes. You know, it just, just happens. <laughs> People stopped going to the dentist during the pandemic, and then a lot of them ended up in the emergency room with terrible infections. That mm-hmm. was a big problem. And yeah. other dental infections were big when they sort of op- things were opening up again. My friend is an ER nurse. She's like, people coming in with dental infections, like up the wazoo. You know, that was a big issue as it, well. They've never, like, had to take care of that stuff before. They got everything opened up and then went back to their normal lives. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, you know, so I, I think that, you know, creating more hospitals and, you know, medical facilities is very important, I, I believe. You know, I want to get, you know, sort of find ways to incentivize, incentivize, that's a big word again, Inse- incentives for doctors and nurses to come and move back, in, you know, into the five mm-hmm. boroughs. And, yeah. um, so we have like a nice, healthy medical staff, mm-hmm. you know, and having the proper equipment and, and mm-hmm. modernizing, you know, computerizing things that are very, you know, streamlining the system. Mm-hmm. Cause that is, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's, I don't, I don't work in a hospital. So I'd like to speak to somebody that does, but 
and understand the administration, but I could tell you that it's not streamlined at all. Mm -hmm. And and also ways to prevent mistakes from happening. Mm -hmm. When a patient comes in, to prevent them from getting the wrong medication or the wrong treatment, there's ways to do it through computer, you know, the computer and stuff like that. And having hard and 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 hard copies and also copies in the computer as well. So there's like double, there's a double mm -hmm. check. Yeah, just in case the computers mess up because right. we know that happens. <laughs> we really need to, I think. I mean, we're kind of a third world nation in our hospitals in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see some hospitals in Asia, like, oh, my God, like they mm -hmm. press the button, their finger, the whole thing opens up and they have their, they you know, I, I've checked into city MD in two seconds. Like it's, you know, I've gone there to urgent care and I've just been able to go in and it's like the easiest thing ever. It's the hospital right. is the same way, you know. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that go abroad for almost any procedures. Really? Uh, yeah, they're, um, you know, you especially a good example is uh thailand uh they uh one of the one of the specific things that they do uh differently than we do is they have they are much more narrow in what they do as a doctor so you know if you are if you're somebody that's good at fixing broken fingers most likely you fix broken fingers all day which means that you get really good at fixing broken fingers better than literally anyone in America could be because they've just, you've fixed hundreds of thousands of times more fingers than anyone else. Uh, so they're able to be so much better at what they do. Um, and because their healthcare is so cheap and also compared to the American dollar, it's ridiculously cheap. Uh, there's a lot of people going so their their business is constant they're not worried about you know are they going to make ends meet and pay for their uh their building their it's just not a concern for them because it's such a robust system but uh one of my one of my good friends uh lived and worked in thailand for quite some time and he'll tell you almost any procedure that you would get in america um you can buy a round trip ticket to thailand uh, pay for like a nice Airbnb there for about a two to three weeks. So recovery time afterwards and everything and pay for the procedure for hundreds of dollars cheaper than just the procedure on insurance would be here in America. So, I mean, yeah, there's, there, there are ways to fix the system and, you know, I've, yeah. I've done a little bit of research, but I'd like to work with people that have done more. Yeah. Sure. I, mean, I know me too. I think there's definitely a way to, to, to fix it. I mean, it's unbelievable how the system is so behind and we're supposed to be like one of the greatest countries in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We have to work harder, I guess, you know, <laughs> anyway, this is, I have to, I have a meeting right. at five actually. So we did so much fun, okay. David. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. My pleasure. Uh, before you go, uh, do you want to just quick uh, pitch of like how people can get involved with the campaign? That'd be awesome. We're looking for, you know, volunteers, obviously. So if you want to volunteer, be a part of the movement, go to pressmanformayor.com. Please donate. I'm not a billionaire or a millionaire <laughs> like Andrew <laughs> Yang and the rest of the crew. So um, please donate. What, I, even if you just donate five, ten dollars a month, that'd be great. I know people are struggling, but donate some money uh, so we can have a great energized campaign. Be a part of the campaign. Please uh, come on, volunteer, tell your friends about it. Have them go on the website, donate. Uh, that's the way to you know, get the word of mouth out. You know, write me, hit me up about policies you don't want to see in the city, things that maybe we haven't thought of. We're still writing, mm -hmm. obviously, our policies and our uh, objectives. So, you know, you know, give me some input. Let me know what you want to see in the city in 2021. And uh, follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. And uh, let's have a great run for 2021. Pressman for mayor. Thank you. All right. Thank, well, thank you so much. Uh, it, was, it was a true pleasure uh, getting to talk to you and meeting you. Yeah, uh, awesome. Great to and meet you. I look, yeah, I look, forward to, uh, I look forward to working with you. Yeah, I'm so excited. Thank you. All thank right. you so much for having me. This was an awesome two hours, and I really enjoyed our My conversation. Pleasure. We can go on for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, David, and have a great uh, new year as well. Thank you. You as well. Thank All you. Right. Bye. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, if you want to stay in touch, uh, 
please follow me on Twitter uh, at David Fight or at Fight for Liberty. Um, you can donate and keep the, the message going and the movement growing. Uh, Patreon.com slash Fight for Liberty. Uh, I really appreciate uh, any anything that helps. Uh, you know, like like Stacy said, five ten dollars a month uh, really adds up. So please uh, go on to Patreon uh, or uh, to fightforliberty.com and click that donate button. Uh, really appreciate it. I will be back again um, next time with another episode of Fight for Liberty. Some more awesome conversations with some true. Uh, patriots and and growers of the liberty philosophy and the liberty movement so i really appreciate you guys uh watching and keeping me going so thank you so much and we'll catch you next time hey guys thanks for watching don't forget to click the like and subscribe buttons below follow us on facebook twitter and instagram at fight for liberty and support the channel at patreon.com slash fight for liberty and as always Keep up the fight.